Hi, I'm Lena Rowald. And I'm Carlton Coffrin. And in this bonus materials for convex relaxations and power system optimization, we're going to be talking about bound tightening for power flow analysis. So to motivate what we're going to get into with bound tightening, it's key to think about how bounds on the variables in your problem connect to convex relaxations. So let's start with a very simple example to motivate this. Imagine you had a non-convex constraint, y equals x squared. So the reason that this is non-convex is because you should be on this black curvy line and not you know, a convex set inside of the black curvy line. So what can you do to convexify this without knowing anything else about the problem? You can just say, all right, well, I can be inside of this uh, parabola cone. So this uh, blue area is indicating you know, a, a convex feasibility set, which includes all the points of the original quadratic constraint. Now, this is actually the best you can do if this is all you know about your problem, but uh, it's very rare that you run into these types of constraints in isolation. There's usually lots of other information out there. So you can ask yourself, is this the smallest convex set? Um, for this very specific case, yes. But what if we knew that um, the value of x could only be between minus 1 and 1? Then we could actually have a constraint that uh, y is greater than x squared and y is less than or equal to 1. So you can add this additional kind of uh, hyperplane in there, which greatly reduces the size of uh, points inside of this feasible region. Um, now, what if I knew for whatever reason that x was greater than between 0 and 1? Now I can actually say, well, this is bounded by y is less than or equal to x. And you can see we've shrunk the feasible set of the convex set um, by a huge amount at this point. Okay, so this what you are doing here is really you are not only kind of adding in the constraints that x is between minus 1 and 1 or that x is between one uh, 0 and 1, but you're also then kind of going through the additional step of deriving a new constraint on y mm. based on those bounds on x. Correct. So we're jointly thinking about the constraint y equals x squared and the additional constraints on the bound of x, and then seeing you know all together, all of those constraints, what is the smallest convex region that we could define. So, what does this have to do with uh, power flow relaxations? Well, um, some types of power flow relaxations are highly parameterized by the variable bounds in your optimal power flow problem. So one of the most uh, popular ones that has these kind of parameters is called the QC relaxation, um, and we proposed it a number of years back. Um, and the key observation here was that if you look at the real number representation of a power flow uh, constraint, you have things like voltage magnitude squared, the product of voltage magnitudes cosine and sine terms with voltage angle differences. And what we observed is that in practice, the voltage angle differences might be fairly small. And if that's the case, you can define kind of reasonable convex sets for different components of this um, big power flow constraint. So uh, we derived a quadratic outer approximation for the cosine function within the bounds of minus pi over 2 and pi over 2, which has this type of a shape to it. We also developed a uh, polyhedral outer approximation for the sine function within similar bounds, uh, which defines a region like this one. And then we built on established results for taking the product of uh, continuous numbers so that you could uh, make these McCormick envelopes which describe this like saddle shape, the, the outer approximation of this saddle shape. Um, so all of these relaxations are, are parameterized by the bounds on the voltage magnitudes and these angle differences. So the next key observation is that the smaller those variable bounds are, the more they reduce the relax relaxation area, and it can be a very drastic reduction. So for example, here is uh, the difference if you can reduce the bounds on the sine function, how much tighter you can make the feasible area. And you can see here the gray area is indicating the whole feasibility set, so it's getting, you know, we're reducing the bounds by half, but the area is getting much smaller than one half. 
Um, the effect is even more dramatic in something like the cosine. So as you're able to tighten the bounds, the area of the cosine function will get much, much smaller. So the core idea of bound tightening is kind of to figure out what are the smallest variable bounds that you can use for these convex relaxations and without removing any value in the original problem. So for a specific operating point, these bounds might be very tight. So for example, um, if you know the load profile, you can probably reduce the operating bounds of your power flow problem by a lot. Um, or even if there's a small uncertainty set around the load profile, you can probably reduce them a lot. The values which are given in the data set are kind of for any possible load profile. They're kind of like the, the uh, universal operating constraints of the power network, not for a specific point in time. So the idea was, can we take advantage of that? And the basic approach is to use this idea called optimization-based bound tightening, OBBT, uh, which is a fairly standard idea in um, nonlinear programming and mixed integer nonlinear programming, where we're going to solve uh, optimization problems to improve the variable bounds. Um, and this is talked at great length in this citation as well. So what's the intuition of this OBBT thing? This is our original AC power flow problem. What we're going to do is ignore this uh, objective function, which would try to minimize the cost, and then we're going to replace it with different quantities of interest uh, that will lead to the variable bounds. So if we try to say minimize WII, we're going to get at the optimal solution to this problem, the globally optimal solution to this problem, we'll get a lower bound on the voltage magnitude. If we negate it and we basically turn the minimization into a maximization, at the global optimal solution, we'll get an upper bound on the voltage magnitude. We can do the same trick for the angle of these WIJ variables, and that basically tells us how wide can the angle difference get on any branch in the network. And of course, you just negate it to get an upper bound instead of a lower bound. So this is, we're really talking about here computing you know, the global optimal solution of a non-convex problem where we've, where we've changed the objective function. So there's some good news and bad news with this kind of approach. The good news is if we computed this for then we got the global optimal solution for every one of these problems, uh, we would have the tightest possible variable bounds for W on, that you could ever have for your particular instance. The bad news is we need to solve all these optimization problems, which is kind of like there are two of them for every node and every edge in the network. And these are non-convex problems, so they're super hard. It's actually not any easier to do this than it is to do the original problem where we were trying to optimize the, the generation cost. So the key idea is don't solve the, the non-convex problem. Replace all those constraints with your favorite convex relaxation, which we can compute much faster and then do the same trick, overwrite the objective function with these different variables which you want to compute the upper and lower bounds on, and then solve this huge pile of optimization problems. So what's the good news and bad news? The good news is we can solve this particular relaxed problem really fast. So it's, uh, it's going to be much easier to compute and get a global optimal bound. Uh, the bad news is, again, still solving, you know, two times the number of nodes plus the number of edges, convex problems can take a lot of time, but it is trivially parallelizable. So you can, uh, you can do them all in parallel, which is good news. Um, also here, isn't it a good reason for using the convex relaxations here is that you can actually prove that the objective function is an upper or a lower bound on the true value relative to the if you had considered the same problem with the non-convex constraint. So it is easier to solve, it might not be the same solution you would have obtained, but it is, um, it is, it is certainly not taking away something that would have been there in the original problem. Right, so I would interpret that as uh, the bounds that you'll compute with these relaxations will not be as tight as they could be, they're going to be a little bit looser than, pot, than the best ones because you're using the convex relaxation. But the only reason this is a 
a reasonable thing to do is because they're optimistic. Mm -hmm. If those bounds or this objective optimization was a pessimistic estimate, then you would be tightening the bounds too much on your variables and you would uh, potentially eliminate a solution. So that's one of the reasons why we're doing this bonus material is this whole approach to tightening bounds is really uh, requires a relaxation property. Mm -hmm. Relative to a re a restriction or an approximation. Correct. Mm -hmm. I don't think that you can't use either of those to do this type of computation. And the reason you would not solve, so let's say you could solve the non-convex uh, problem fast. Mm -hmm. Um, you would still not have guarantees that you would find the globally optimal solution. Is it, that correct? It, it depends what method you use to solve the non-convex problem. Yeah. If you use a local solver, then yes, you won't, you won't be guaranteed to have the optimal global optimal solution, and then you may accidentally remove some, uh, some solutions. Mm -hmm. And especially because you're changing the objective function all over the place, it's uh, not clear that any results on the quality of the local solvers carry over to this type of analysis. Mm -hmm. um, OK, so this problem, we, with a convex relaxation, we can potentially do it fast. Now, there's another key observation which is uh, very interesting. So if the relaxation is parameterized by variable bounds, and we use that relaxation to tighten uh, some variable bounds in our problem, then it can actually benefit itself from the new bounds that it, it calculates. So there's a, there's a circular dependency here where it's like if you use a relaxation to improve a bound, that relaxation will become tighter with the bound it computed itself. So instead of just doing this kind of once and then improving all the bounds, what you would actually want to do is some kind of a positive feedback loop, where basically you build the relaxed model, you tighten all the, you try to tighten all the bounds in the problem, then if any one of them was tightened, potentially the relaxed model could be even better. So you go back and you rebuild it and you tighten them all again. Um, and so this is guaranteed because all the problems are, are um, convex and tightening bounds is a monotone operation, this is will definitely converge in a finite number of steps, but you don't know. It could take 10 rounds, it could take 100 rounds, it could be uh, uh, quite an undertaking. Do you need to start out to build a relaxed model, you need some initial uh, guess on the bounds? That's correct. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the core insights of the original QC relaxation paper was that in the OPF formulation, there was sufficient information to actually bound all those different quantities. Um, in some optimization problems, you don't have good bounds, and you kind of have to assume that they're infinitely large. Mm -hmm. um, so the point here is that if you're going to do this kind of massive uh, optimization effort, it really better be worth doing all this computation. You may get a lot of improvements. So. Um, let's talk about a little bit about what you can gain and how much you can improve on some realistic test cases. So to do that, I'm going to introduce a measure of bound improvement. So let's say that in the original problem, the bounds of our variable x were ranging from 0.8 to 1.2. And so we'll say this span was, say, like a, a span of 0.4. And then in the first iteration, we compute it and we're able to tighten it to, say, 0.9 and 1.15, so now we have a span of 0.25, and we go on and go forth. At some point, we kind of read our, reach our fixed point, we can't improve it anymore, and now the span is 0.1. What I'll say is that, you know, there's a percentage of the final span relative to the original, uh, so that would be 1 over, uh, 0.1 over 0.4, so this would be, our bound is now 25% of the original bound. Mm -hmm. So if we look at kind of the core cases in the IEEE PGLib OPF test cases, and we run this type of analysis, this is the distribution of bound improvements across all buses in all networks that we see from um, on the voltage magnitudes. And I'm showing a box and whisker plot here, so you basically the black line is the mean, you have the first and third quantiles on the sides, and then the outliers um, with these... Uh, whiskers. So here we've reduced uh, on average the bounds by more than 50%. I think that's pretty interesting given that uh, there's plus or minus 
10% is kind of a typical bound, so maybe we've reduced the voltage magnitudes on some parts of the network by half, um, but maybe it's not clear that that would bring a lot of value in an optimization context. But when you look at the difference in the angle bounds, which are typically kind of given um, a, a very wide in a network, say like plus or minus 30 degrees or 60 degrees, these ones were able to reduce drastically. So we're looking on average, they're about uh, 5% of the original bounds that were given. Uh, and even the worst case outliers, like uh, it's reduced the size of those bounds by half. Also, interestingly, is that some of the uh, so all the so in the case of the angle differences, really all the angle differences are tightened improved. or yep. are improved. Whereas for the voltages, it seems like on some of the buses, the voltages are able to reach their original Limits. full range. Yep. Uh -huh. So that means that on those uh, nodes, there would be actually um, there would be operating points where you could reach the highest allowable voltage and the lowest allowable voltage. Correct. Okay. And uh, I think it's important to note that these results I'm showing are for only the default load profile in these cases. So if you start changing the load profile, you know, the things could be very different. But in the original paper where we talk about this method, we do some analysis on if you had uncertainty about the load, you know, how much would you, you be able to deduce? And you can still reduce the bounds pretty significantly. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would argue that this drastic reduction in the uh, angle difference bounds on the lines is very much worth the amount of time we're going to spend doing the big computation of optimizing all these different um, sub-problems. And to give you an impression of what that is, I'll just show you this example on the IEEE 14 bus test case. Um, so typically we're using bound tightening as a way of improving convex relaxations, but uh, it's actually giving you a lot more information than just this is a tighter relaxation of my problem and this is like a smaller optimality gap. If we look at the um, these reduced angle difference bounds, we can actually deduce the directionality of the angle, um, like is it a positive angle or a negative angle, on almost all of the lines in this network. So basically the power in this particular network, network has to flow in the direction of these particular arrows. Um, and we know this for any possible uh, generator dispatch, uh, given the load profile that's in that test case. The, the phase angles are basically telling you, okay, the power has to go in this direction. And I think there's some interesting things here. Uh, for example, the flow from bus four to bus three is kind of in the, maybe the reverse direction you might expect, but uh, there's a big load at bus three, and so that's just how it works. And this is a consequence of Ohm's law that we're seeing being revealed by the bound tightening. Mm -hmm. There are uh, two edges in the network where based on the generator dispatch, you can kind of switch the direction of the flow. Uh, but I didn't know that until I did this analysis that there was kind of such a rigid set of flows in this particular network. Hmm. Interesting. And it's maybe not surprising given that all the generators are on one side and all the loads are on the other, that kind of all has to flow in one direction. But now this is a tool which lets you reason about these things over the full AC equations. Mm -hmm. So uh, just to recap what we've covered in this lecture, um, variable bounds are a critical piece to a number of convex relaxations out there. Um, convex relaxations can actually be used to improve variable bounds, and then that can then lead to them improving themselves. Um, and what we've seen here is that the bounds in the PGLib benchmark cases are surprisingly, um, they can be tightened by a surprising amount. And then these tighter bounds may be useful for a variety of analysis, not just you know, using the objective, improving the objective function and trying to prove you have a global optimal solution. Mm -hmm. um, I'll also note that uh, I've made this kind of workflow uh, freely available uh, as a software in Python that you can use here. Cool. Good.